So I think we in sales always consider ourselves the center of the universe. Um, note to self, we're not. We didn't create this shift. Our buyers did. Hello, Sales Nation. I am Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, and welcome to today's episode. In today's show, we have Trish Petruzzi, and we're talking about the future of sales, or potentially, which is splitting the account manager, territory manager, salesperson's role into smaller roles for each part of the buyer's journey, I guess, from prospecting to initial meetings to close to follow up and account management, having a separate individual or separate team working each one of these steps in the sales cycle. You can find out more about Trish over at bridgegroupinc.com where she runs uh, an inside sales consulting firm. She's got a new book out called The Sales Development Playbook, which is a must read for any of the sales management and sales leadership listening who wanna build a more predictable and repeatable pipeline. And with all that said, without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Hi Trish, and welcome to The Salesman Podcast. Hi, and I'm thrilled to be here. I am thrilled that you're on as well. We're going to dive into a topic today, which is going to become clearly increasingly relevant for the sales industry as a whole, uh, but then for myself and a whole chunk of the audience that this perhaps is more in the tech sphere. You can fill me in on this. And I think it's going to gradually fade over to everywhere else. I know in the medical device world, uh, it hadn't hit um, when I left it to start doing the show. So what I want to get into is this shift from perhaps outside sales to inside sales, and then this shift from the sales professional that does it all, which is what I did of the prospecting to the rapport building to the, the complex sale to the close to physically, I would go in and train the surgeons how to use the endoscopes mm. and spend time with them in theaters. Um, and Must then, have been fun, endoscopes. I, mm. Well, I, so uh, put it in context, I was using, so surgical endoscopes in theaters as opposed to colonoscopes mm. or anything of that nature that's props. <laughs> Uh, less palatable after you just had your lunch than um, <laughs> uh, than seeing seeing a screen and seeing the insides from a screen. So that, that's yeah. where I was at with it. Um, but let's again put this into context for the people this is new to. Yeah. Why is it the shift, Trish? Why why is the, the the why why is all this happening? Is it just more efficient? Is it as simple as that? So I think we in sales always consider ourselves the center of the universe. <laughs> Um, note to self, we're not. We didn't create this shift. Our buyers did. So if you think about it in the context of the buyer, they are busier than ever, ever before. They have less time, more work, and they want us to be efficient and add value. If you look at all of that, what that says is, I don't have a time to give you an hour to come into my office. And for some reason, when people meet face to face, they always think it has to be an hour meeting. Um, they don't have time for that anymore. They don't have time for these elongated conversations. They want you to net net it out and net netting it usually can be done over the phone. That's one aspect. Another aspect I think is that our buyers are getting younger and they're used to using technology. So they use the technology to gather information and they want you to use the technology to commun communicate with them. So my theory, and I'm sticking to it, is that sales didn't cause this shift that our buyers did. And I'm sure you have data on a lot of this, uh, whether it's been full or fully researched and vetted and that kind of thing, or whether it's just anecdotal. Um, I guess that's regardless with your, your, the company that you're, you're, you're involved with and all that kind of stuff. You're obviously at the epicenter of this shift. Is this something that is measurable? And I'm intrigued personally in this, from the shift from one salesperson to multiple roles and then the shift from outside to inside. Is the, over the longer term, revenue benefits to all of this or is a lot of it cost saving as well and i'm going around the point that you just made then uh, mm. which will become clear for us in a second i don't think it's cost savings i think years ago it was cost savings everyone um, thought inside sales which was so much more cost effective than field sales and to some extent it is when you're um but Another thing that's changed, though, is that field sales, a lot of their expense was travel. And believe it or not, great field salespeople are now great inside salespeople that just probably travel 20% of the time. So I think a lot of the expense that was once associated with field sales has been diminished. 
um, by the, the way that they have learned how to adapt and to use tools like phone, web, and social media to communicate as well. That was the answer to the first part of your question. And since I'm not that smart, I forget what the second part was. Me as well. It doesn't matter. And I, <laughs> to follow on from that then, and I'm just trying to add a level of context before we yep. get into the the really intriguing, uh, looking perhaps into the future side of things. Yeah. What are the roles now that are in this little bubble? So you've got SDRs. Tell us a little bit about yep. them. And then perhaps we can go down the, the sales funnel and the process sure. and the different individual roles that now take up parts of it. Right. So there's not one set of roles that's right for every single company, but there are a variety of roles that are in play now. And you just have to sort of figure out which ones are right for you, your market, your buyer, your solution, et cetera. Um, but there are sales development. I mean, huge emerging market obviously one I'm focused on, where those people are responsible for the front end of the sales process. They're responsible for pipeline generation, whether that comes in the form of introductory meetings or whether that comes in the form of actually qualified opportunities. Sales development reps are focused there. Drilling down into that category, a lot of people do role specialization in sales development. You have your inbound sales development reps and you have your outbound sales development reps. And now to complicate things even further, we're going to have account-based sales development. Yes, let's make this as complicated as possible. So that's the front end of the sales process. Then you move into the sales process. You have inside salespeople who carry a discrete quota. You have inside salespeople who are partnered with the field, potentially in a team selling model. You have field salespeople. You have channel partners. Um, there's a whole variety of people that are focused on new logo acquisition. And then, of course, you go to post acquisition and you move to account management and customer success. So I think the key thing to remember is based on your sales model, you really do want to specialize because that specialization will get just such a huge uptick in productivity, but it's not a one size fits all strategy. Is there a level of seniority that goes throughout these positions? Do you start typically in sales development and then make your way to the account management side of things? Is that the way it works or is that just a total um, nonsense? So here's the thing. It, it is a great career path, right? Because I personally think it's harder to qualify an opportunity than it is to close it, right? Because um, getting people to, to engagement is the hardest part of the sales process now because we're killing them with noise and we're <laughs> killing them with content, right? Content is the new spam. And if you don't believe it, too bad, you're wrong, I'm right. So I think it's a great foundation if you know how to qualify an opportunity um, to then move through the sales process. The challenge is that the demand for sales development so far outstrips supply that there's not enough talent out there. So we're hiring um, people one or two years out of college and they don't go to school coming out saying, come on, give me some data. I want to call people who don't <laughs> want to talk to me and suffer massive rejection. So, you know, once again, it's a great place to start, but it doesn't mean you're going to finish in the sales role at the end of the day. For sure. And you said it then, Trish, content. Um, yeah. I'm not going to ask the question that I keep asking, which is, should salespeople create content? Because that is a whole conversation on its own. But where does content marketing come into this new sales process and, and, and this alignment that it seems massively logical from what you're saying? Is it that sales now works closer with marketing so it all fits into one funnel. Do you have sales development who are doing inbound content marketing from the sales side? I guess there's not a one um, stop shop for all of this. There's not one solution that works for everyone, of course. But where does marketing and content fit into it? So I think that's a shifting market. Let me ask you a question. How much, go. Go right? How much content? do you get delivered to you on a daily basis that you didn't ask for, that isn't relevant to you, and that you have no interest in? I am probably not the best person to ask, but this will be this will be a, an interesting answer from that perspective of 
most of the content I get, I've opted in in some way from the sales perspective side of things, mm -hmm. whether that's I've liked a Facebook page and I continue to like it because I'm super ruthless mm -hmm. about unliking, uh, mm -hmm. deleting, banning, uh, you know, ungrouping from from the because the, the, the amount of content that I get thrown at me every day. So mm -hmm. with that said, it's probably not as much as the general consumer and especially in the B2B world were perhaps they are not as hot as me in limiting their focus. Right. But still too much. I don't consume any of it. Right. And, but you used to. I, I Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I think here's what happened. So, you know, we're always in this sea change, right? So first it was marketing automation, when Eloqua Marketo, when they created that market, that outbound ability to deliver to the masses um, was such a brilliant idea, and it ended up being spam cannons, right? So everybody was pushing out content. Everyone decided they had to write blogs and everyone wrote white papers. And it was all about capturing our audience by capturing them with our content. Then we got so carried. And then HubSpot came along and created the whole inbound, killed, outbound <laughs> fanaticism craze. Okay. And so that, you know, I think those events are what created this problem that we're now having being inundated with content, which has, has become less effective in our demand generation efforts. But one place that I think, if done well, content can make a huge resurgence in escalating and accelerating the sales process is in account-based marketing. I'm sure you heard of it. It's account-based marketing. It's account-based sales development. Um, it's account-based everything. I'm going to coin, coin the term account-based revenue. But it is a critical component in those strategies. But it's highly personalized, super, super personalized. So if I'm going to send you content, it's because I know so much about you and what you're interested in and how I can help you learn that I've created it specifically for you. So I'm hoping with this account-based revenue strategy or whatever we choose to call it, that content's going to make a resurgence, but it's going to be hyper-personalized content um, that will become increasingly more valuable to our buyers. So is this, this is fascinating. This is genuinely fascinating because you're talking my language here and this is something I've been thinking, but you are, the way you're describing it is far more eloquent than I've ever managed to talk about on the show before. But of course, the benefits salespeople have over marketers is that they can have that one-to-one -one phone call connection, the rapport, all the good stuff that a marketer spamming out just simply can't. Yep. Does that mean that within the sales process, you're going to have, whether they're a marketer, whatever the title is, you're going to have someone specifically who perhaps it goes to, I, I don't know what even the structure would be, but you'd have someone prospecting, they would provide a bunch of information someone would then create content for that person and then inbound sales development would follow up on the back of that. Is that the process we're looking at? So I'm still crystallizing my thought process around this um, because we're actually going to be, um, based on client requests, we're going to be developing a service around it. But in all of my research, and I've talked to some really smart people about this. I've heard Craig Rosenberg of Topo speak. I talk a lot to John Miller of Engageo. I'm talking to Matt Hines of Hines Marketing. You know, so I'm um, Sanjay over Terminus. I'm picking everyone's brains I can think about. But here is the Trish Bertuzzi version of what it's going to look like. And once again, subject to change as I learn more. <laughs> I'm a company that has a finite market because account-based strategies are not for everyone. So I'm a company that either has a finite market or I'm selling to the enterprise. And I know the accounts I need to go after. So based on that, I create a task force of executives in my company from the CEO level to COO to VPIT to... VP sales, to my sales execs, to my sales development reps, to my content marketing people. And we say, we are going to execute an account-based strategy against these very specific target accounts that we've identified. We create a series of plays or a play that we're going to execute. 
the CEO might do a little bit of research on the CEO of the company I want to go after, find out they like rugby, send them rugby tickets, follow up. The VP of IT might call their VP of IT and say, hey, uh, we have a research briefing. I'd love to share it with you. The field sales reps might be inviting their buyer types to executive breakfast. The sales development reps are calling in at a different level and trying to find out what's going on in the account. What's their current status? Are they open to change? What challenges do they face? How are they currently addressing those challenges? There are targeted ads. There is targeted content. There is customer stories that are like them. So there's all oars in the water providing a personalized sales experience for this account. That's where I think we're going to go with the account-based strategy. I'm intrigued here. Other than a br overall branding perspective, everything you mm. just talked about, for, regardless of titles, uh, putting that aside for one second, they're all sales activities. Is that what we need to be doing? And I, I think, I hope this is the leading question because this is how I feel about it all, of should we just be going out for those one-on-one -on -one connections and putting aside all the sales automation tools that are coming out that allow salespeople to spam all the marketing automation? Is what you're saying, there's just that much noise that the only way to break through is to just have that cliche, I know, but like human-to-human -human connection? Yeah. So the answer is no. I think, I think account-based selling... I'm just going to call it account-based. That strategy for right now, you know, it, it's for either part of your market, if you have an enterprise um, solution, or once again, a finite market. There are a, a million companies out there that still need to sell better and smarter, but in much more, I hate to use the word transactional, mm -hmm. but uh, in a, a much more tra traditional way um, where you reach out to your buyer, add value, engage in meaningful conversation and no sales starts until somebody has a conversation um, and then bring them through your sales process. So I think it's, I think we have to get smarter. We always implement one model. We're like, okay, here's my sales strategy. Well, how about if we take a breath, think about the different components and the different markets we're trying to get at and then create strategies appropriate to that market. That's where I think we're going to go. So for the B2B salesperson who's listening, most likely a longer term or complex sale from the, yeah. the data that I've gathered about the audience, but other people in there as well. There's entrepreneurs, there's CEOs that listen to the show. What can they take away from all this from a practical standpoint at this yeah. moment in time in 2016? Clearly, they shouldn't be just plodding along. And uh, you know, if, if they've been doing things from this time last year and they thought they were up to date, Perhaps they had created a little email list and they were sending out semi-customized emails with reports that were semi-relevant mm -hmm. and they were adding people on LinkedIn and doing the, the, again, cliche social selling thing. What should they be doing right this moment, Trish, to get ahead of the game to make themselves stand out versus the competition? And, and this is an individual salesperson. What can they do? So that's a great question because I will tell you at the end of the day, all of our products are exactly the same. You might have a competitive differentiator for five minutes and then your competitor is going to come up and, you know, create that same widget or whatever and the playing field gets leveled again. So how do you win? You a, become a better salesperson. You become more thoughtful. You become more personal. You become more human, more relevant. It's not about banging on people. It's about engaging with people. So if you're human and you're relevant and you're interesting and you're telling your buyer a story through every touch you have with them, you can tell a story in voicemail, email, um, socially. So just I think we need to become better storytellers and not just at engagement, but to get us to engagement. And do you think that is a shift? Because that's a shift I see in the and going back in my time in sales when I, and this is only five, six years ago, but it was, you know, here's your features and benefits. This endoscope is 10 millimeters wide. It's a millimeter shorter or, or thinner than the competition. And so Mr. Surgeon, 
you will have easier suturing at the end of the procedure. Then, right. of course, you get a level deeper than that, and then you're talking about the patient benefits, and you get a level deeper than that and deeper than that. But something I never really implemented until I do started doing the podcast and until I started understanding marketing in its wider context and how to tell my story to the audience because they like... they. The, the best shows are the ones like this where we're just having a conversation and you can see a progress, you can see a journey and, and clearly that's a story that's wrapped up in just an overarching conversation. And I wasn't aware of all this 12 months ago when I first started out. Is that a shift that's happening because all the content that's out there, if something, even if it's poorly produced, for example, YouTube videos that go viral, even if it's perhaps not the best written, even if it's perhaps slower to download, all these technical things that we all focus on. If it's an amazing story and it grips us, and if your product's wrapped up in a story, surely that is going to s- surpass all the other content out there. So I'm, I've thrown yeah. about five questions at you there, but what I want to ask is, are stories something that's changed and developed? And th- is that something that we should be focusing on as salespeople? Well, who doesn't like a story? You've liked a story since you were two years old. That doesn't change. Um, I think stories are interesting. Stories are human. I mean, it, it, nobody cares about features and benefits. It's like, tell me how this makes helps me build a better business. Tell me how this helps my customers or my clients. Tell me something I don't know, and then I'll engage with you. And what happens when someone's listening to this, they're scratching their head, they're in, they're in the car, they're driving to the next sales meeting now and they're going, oh, um, I'm not actually that thoughtful. I'm just really here because the commission's pretty good. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reasonably relevant. I don't really know much about the industry. I'm not that interesting. I'm probably just going to go home and watch Game of Thrones uh, and a marathon of House of Cards tonight and, you know, not really engage with anyone else in the company or anything along those lines. <laughs> But, and, and clearly this is a skewed viewpoint because anyone who's searching out a podcast like what we're doing, they're likely uh, more of a go-getter and they're trying to improve themselves. But yeah. are the people who aren't thoughtful, who aren't relevant, aren't interesting, are they just going to find themselves without a job in the not-too-distant future? No. I mean, not everyone's going to be an A player. No, and the reason I ask this is going down and making this shift from transactional to value adding, they're all the ways that you add value as a salesperson. So if you can't physically add value yourself, surely you become irrelevant and you can just be replaced by an online order form. Well, I don't know if you can be replaced by an online order form, but you can certainly be replaced. Um, you know, so here's the thing that's hard for me. I mean, sales has been my passion my entire life. There is, I can't even imagine, I can't even imagine doing any other job. So if you're just doing it to collect a paycheck and you're bored and you can't wait for the end of the day to come and, you know, maybe go think about doing something else because there's a lot of people out there that your customer would rather talk to. But we all have our A players, we all have our B players, we all have our C players, and that's just the way it is and that's not going to change no matter what shift comes along. If you don't have the desire, self-motivation, self-education, there's a concept. We all sit around and wait for our companies to provide us with training and education. I don't know. Read a book. Hey, read my book, right? So um, if they're not motivated, there's nothing we can do about it. And that's what I wanted to wrap up this part of the show with, Trish, is is reading books is uh, there's you know, countless online courses, that kind of thing. Yeah. For the salesperson listening, is that, and listening to podcasts like this, of course, is that the best, uh, quickest, most bang for book way to improve your ability to sell? So that's a hard thing for me to answer because I'm an avid reader. Um, I know a lot of people who hate to read, but they consume books on Audible. Uh, business books on Audible. There's just such great thought leadership out there in the form of books, blogs, podcasts, and lately events. Events, there's an event that I want to go to probably twice a month. And, you know, you just can't go to them all. It's cost prohibitive. But, you know, I'm going to an event that's sponsored by um, Sales Hacker and 
uh, sales force next month called Sales Machine. Mm-hmm. I mean, Simon Sinek, Billy Bean, Arianna Huffington, Gary V, Seth Godin. Those are some of the speakers that are going to be there just off the top of my head also. <laughs> but, um, you know, sometimes you go to an event and it's not just the speakers you learn from. Networking with your peers. It kills me when I go to an event and I see a group of salespeople from the same company hanging around with those same people throughout the whole event. Network. Work the room, baby. Talk to your peers. That's how you learn so much. And uh, final point in this. Do you see a resurgence in sales becoming quote unquote cool at the moment? Because this is a shift that I'm seeing and I don't know if that, I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, but yeah. clearly for the past few years, entrepreneurship has been the, the cool thing. Um, yeah. uh, perhaps that is slowing down gradually. Do you think sales has gotten cooler and an alternative in that you can make great money, you perhaps got less risk and responsibility than being an entrepreneur, and you're a bit more shielded from from total loss and devastation. Um, but you're still autonomous, and you've still <laughs> you've still got the opportunities there to to grow within the business as well. So I think it depends on what company you work for, because a great salesperson at a great company is an entrepreneur, right? They're working their territory like it's their own business and just get out of their way and stay out of their way. So I think that's sort of best of both worlds. But is sales cool if you're a risk taker, if you have no fear, if you don't need the same paycheck week to week that it can skyrocket and plummet and you can live that way? Um, I think it's the coolest thing ever, but once again, I was born to do this. Love it. Absolutely love it, Trish. I've got a couple of questions to ask everyone that comes on the show, so we'll run through these. First one, who is the world's greatest salesperson? Jill Conrath. And I'm going to tell you why. I didn't want to write a book. I didn't want to write a book. I did not want to write a book. (laughs) And she just kept selling me and selling me and selling me. And finally, I wrote a book. And it's a great book. And I don't know how she did it, but she did. So here's to you, Ms. Conrath. Nice. Well, you can do me a favor, Trish, because Jill is the only person that I've asked that hasn't come on the show so far. So you can put in a good word with her for us. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, no. if, I'm not sure if we've done something wrong uh, in the in the past or what. But uh, yeah, you can you can you can do some selling for me on that perspective. Go She's on. been writing her new book, which comes out course, um, yeah. in the fall. But I will put in a good word for you. Good stuff. Appreciate that. Next one. What is one book or resource other than your own and other than Jill's that you'd recommend to the Salesman Podcast audience? Oh, does there only have to be one? Yeah, one well, one the top the the most bang for book right this right this second. Okay, I love Keenan's Not Taught. I love Mike Weinberg's two books, Sales Simplified and Sales Management Simplified. I love Jeb Blount's Fanatical Prospecting. I really like Aaron Ross's new book, From Impossible to Inevitable. Um, as I could keep going. <laughs> well, we'll include links to them in the show notes for this episode over at salesman.red for anyone who is running on a treadmill and trying to scribble things down on the back of the hand uh, as we as we go through these. And final one for me, Trish, and this is something that I ask everyone that comes on the show, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be one piece of advice you'd give her to help her become better at sales? I wish I had the attitude about learning when I was younger that I do now. I, I mean, I've met some amazing young women sales leaders lately who are so committed to learning their craft that they're like, I'm embarrassed at, at my success compared to, compared to where they got so fast because of that level of commitment. So I guess it's, it's, I wish I had understood the value of self-education earlier. Amazing. And with that, Trish, tell us a little bit about the book and also where we can find out more about you and everything that you're doing. Sure. So the book is called The Sales Development Playbook, How to Build Pipeline and Accelerate Growth Through Inside Sales. Very long title, but yep, there it is. Available on Amazon. Um, my firm is The Bridge Group. We are a inside sales consulting firm focused on the B2B tech space at bridgegroupinc.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Bridge Group Inc. 
Amazing stuff. Well, with that, I want to thank you for your insights. I genuinely am fascinated with all this, so I do appreciate it. I want to thank you for your time and I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. It has been my pleasure. Thank you, Trish, for coming on the show. Massively appreciate it. Thanks for your energy as well. I had a good time recording this one. I want to thank you, Sales Nation, for tuning in. If you're listening to this on iTunes and you're not subscribed, subscribe and make sure that you're getting the show delivered to you completely free every single day. If you're watching this on YouTube, again, make sure you're clicking that subscribe button so you get notifications of when we put out new episodes. You don't miss anything. And with all that said, I'll speak with you all again tomorrow.